Welcome everyone to our October A to J Author New User Webinar. This is Jessica Frank, A to J Authors Project Manager. Today we're going to focus on accessibility in document assembly development. Today's focus on accessibility is broken down into three main sections. We'll talk about authoring tips, including plain language, pop-ups, language access, and learn mores, including how to add image tags, supplemental tags, and transcripts for videos. And then we'll talk about software enhancements, things the A to J author development team has done to make our, the A to J viewer more accessible, including behind the scenes metadata and our new document preview for A to J text templates. And then finally, I'll talk about the best practices guide that I created um, for PDF accessibility. First, let's talk about the four main guiding principles of accessibility upon which WCAG has been built. So WCAG, W-C-A-G, is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and those are guidelines for uh, technology and internet for making content as accessible as possible. There's A, AA, and AAA standards. Um, and the content that I'm going to bring you here in terms of this, this POOR acronym came from CUNY. Um, with a, they have a great accessibility guide that can be found at the link shown here. So these four principles are known by the acronym of POOR, P-O-U-R, for perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. POOR is a way of approaching web accessibility by breaking it down into four main aspects. Many of the technology challenges faced by people with disabilities can be described using one of the POOR principles. So let's talk about first, perceivable. It means that users can identify content and interface elements by means of the senses. So for many users, this means perceiving a system primarily visually, while for others, perceivability may be a matter of sound or touch. Some of the problems under perceivable, um, some examples of that, is that a website's navigation consists of a number of links that are displayed in a different order from page to page. So if a user has to relearn basic navigation for each page, it becomes very difficult for them to effectively move throughout the website. Another example is a Word document that contains a number of non-English words and phrases. And if the languages are not clearly indicated, then assistive technology cannot present that text correctly. Same thing with um, in the legal space, in our document assembly space, with phrases that might be in Latin or are not common in the English language, so that are legalese. Some solutions under the perceivable uh, part of the acronym are text alternatives. So provide text alternatives for any non-text content so that it can be changed into other forms people need, such as large print, braille, speech, symbols, or simpler language. Um, provide alternatives for time-based media. Make it adaptable. So create content that can be presented in different ways. For example, a simpler layout without losing any of the information or structure and distinguishable. So make it easier for users to see and hear content using separated foreground from background. As we're going through all of this, this poor acronym, just think that in, uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to talk about different ways that this is being applied into A to J author. So this is just giving you background and context into um, sort of the improvements that we've made and some of the suggestions that we have for you as authors uh, to make your guided interviews more accessible. The next uh, letter down is O, operable. Operable means that a user can successfully use the controls, the buttons, the navigation, and other interactive elements. For many users, this means using assistive technology like voice recognition, keyboards, and screen readers. Some problems under op operable, um, some examples, are mouse-dependent web content will be inaccessible to a person who cannot use a standard mouse. People with low or no vision also rely on the functionality of the keyboard. They may be able to manipulate a mouse just fine, but it doesn't do them much good because they can't see where they're clicking on the screen. The keyboard is much easier for a person who is blind to, mani to manipulate than um, a mouse. Some of the solutions under um, the operable uh, guideline is keyboard accessibility. So make all functionality available from a keyboard. Keyboard accessibility is one of the most important principles of web accessibility because it cuts across different disability types and different technologies. Um, enough time, so provide users enough time to read and use the content. Design content in a way that is known to uh, not cause seizures. So ensure that color contrast, no flashing, um, no strobe light, that kind of thing. 
and navigable. So provide ways to help users navigate, find content, and determine where they are on the page. The next one down is understandable. So users should be able to comprehend the content and learn and remember how to use your site. Um, your site should be consistent in its presentation and format, predictable in its design and usage patterns, and appropriate to the audience in its tone and voice. Some problems under understandable, some examples, a website's navigation consists of a number of links that are displayed in a different order from page to page, and a site makes use of numerous abbreviations, acronyms, and jargon. If they're never defined, how can users with disabilities and others understand the content? Some solutions under understandable is to make the content readable and understandable, obviously. Make it predictable, so make web pages appear and operate in predictable ways. And uh, have input assistance, help users avoid and correct mistakes. The final one down is robust. Content must be robust enough that it can be interpreted reliably by a wide variety of users, allowing them to choose the technology they use to interact with websites, online documents, multimedia, and other information formats. And users should be allowed to choose their own technology to access the content. Some examples of problems under robust is that a website may require a specific version of a web browser to make use of its features. If the user doesn't or can't use that browser, how could they experience the features? or a document format is inaccessible to a screen reader on a particular operating system. Um, if the user employs that operating system for day-to-day -day tasks, then they can't gain access to the document. Some solutions under robust are to maximize compatibility with current and future user agents, including assistant, uh, assistive technologies. So that puts us in the framework of um, accessibility. Let's talk um, about how we can implement that in document assembly and specifically in A to J author. This first section is going to focus on what you as authors can do to make your content as accessible as possible. So let's talk first about plain language. Plain language, defining it. It's not baby talk and it's not even a simplified version of the English language. Writers of plain English let their audience concentrate on the message instead of being distracted by complicated language, and they make sure that their audience understands the message easily. In 2002, a study was done, was released by the National Center for Education Statistics. For five years and with $14 million, they interviewed over 90,000 adults in the United States. This was the most comprehensive study of literacy ever commissioned by the U.S. government and it found that nearly 50% of adults are functionally illiterate in that they cannot balance their checkbooks, they cannot read a drug label, and they cannot write an essay for a job. 21 to 23% are not able to locate information in text, cannot make low-level inferences using printed materials, and were unable to integrate easily identifiable pieces of information. 41 to 44% of the U.S. adults with the lowest levels of literacy were living in poverty, which, um, as we know, that's most often those who become, by necessity, self-represented litigants. So this is why it's particularly important in our work um, to focus on plain language. Now, smaller uh, follow-up study released in 2006 showed no statistical significant improvements in the U.S. adult literacy. So um, that's still a, a while um, from now, but um, it's showing that uh, in general, about half of Americans uh, definitely need plain language for this um, and particularly focus on those who become self-represented litigants. So what have we built into A to J Author that can help you with this? A lot of your content when you're authoring guided interviews should go through a revision. So um, you write the initial interview questions um, generally, the process is you have the, the document that you want to automate, you automate that backend template, and then you have to write the questions to gather that information from the end user. You can either write them out, which is, I prefer to do an outline format, but um, you can put the content directly into A to J author or create a draft ahead of time of the questions you want to ask um, and the variables that you're going to associate with it. But whatever you do, there should probably be a revision step um, before the final process and before it goes to testing with users where you focus on plain language. And here's some tips or some tools that we have within the software to help you do that revision, to take the content from um, the lawyer stage or, or the developer stage in which you're at and put it into about a fifth to seventh grade reading level is um, the goal generally with these forms for self-represented litigants. So we've built a grade level indicator into the A to J author reports. 
the reports tab uh, in your interview. So you have your interview open, you go to the report tab, the full report, and we'll show you a word count, an average word per sentence count, the Flesh Kincaid grade level out, uh, evaluator, and the Coleman Lau grade level evaluator. These tools evaluate the text of your interview questions, the learn more pop-ups, the learn more responses, and any, excuse me, the learn more prompts, the learn more responses, and any pop-ups that you have as well. Each text chunk is individually evaluated, and at the very end, you get a grade level uh, report for your entire interview. It also is gonna give you visual clues about whether or not your content is problematic with green, yellow, and red color scheme to alert you to text blocks that exceed that fifth grade reading level. You get a yellow warning if it's between a 6.0 and an 8.9 grade level, and anything over a nine is red. You can always print this full report with the grade level evaluators in it. So if you are uh, running this by um, a subject matter expert who may not be using the software itself, you can generate a, a print preview and then either save it as a PDF or um, print it. And it will include the grade level indicators as well for any revisions. This is an example of the end with a flush Kincaid um, for this interview, the entire interview. And there's an example uh, up close of e an individual page with indicators of uh, problematic text at a higher than nine grade level. Authors can use the tools that have been built into A to J Author uh, since the beginning. A lot of these that I'll mention have been in A to J um, since our very, very earliest versions of the software. An example of that is pop-ups. So pop-ups are what we call a just-in-time learning feature that allows you as authors to add definitions when you just have to use that legal term. So sometimes there isn't a way to translate a question further into plain language and you have to use that legally relevant term. So for example, sometimes you have to know if they are the petitioner or the respondent because it matters about which branch you're gonna take someone down or you have to check a box on the court form um, and put their content, their information into the right sections of the template and you have to know. Are they the petitioner or the respondent? But many people uh, who will be using it will not know the difference between a petitioner and a respondent. And that's the point in which you should add these definitions. So when you have to use a legally relevant term of art, um, jargon, legalese, or um, a common non-English word like Latin, often found in court forms, make sure you add a pop-up to that to provide that definition just at the point in which the end user needs it. So the word is in blue here, they click on it and up pops that little um, safety raft, the life raft icon and the pop-up, which gives whatever definition it, um, that you've provided. There are lots of great dictionaries out there that provide plain language definitions, particularly in our legal aid and court technology space. Um, so if you're having trouble finding appropriate definition, a quick Google search will likely find uh, something that, that can provide a plain language definition for you to use. Thanks to a grant with Lone Star Legal Aid uh, in March of this year, we were able to add all of the multimedia components in a Learn More, um, including all of the accessibility enhancements that I'll talk about in a little bit, to a pop-up. So now you can add audio, video, and graphics to your pop-ups as well. So sometimes uh, at the point in which you want to define something, you might want to add a video or uh, an image, and that lets uh, this grant lets you do that, including the um, enhancements for accessibility like alt tags for media, transcripts for videos, um, marking it as alternative or supplemental, um, all of that is added into a pop-up as well. So that's a really great enhancement that they uh, provided for us. Now accessibility isn't all about assisted te assistive technology. It relates to ensuring also that your content is accessible to as many people as possible. We know that a lot of self-represented litigants are coming to the courthouse um, and they don't have English as a first language or that's not their strongest language. So a lot of it is about providing uh, as many languages as possible for your content to be in. A to J Author supports 16 languages uh, currently with A to J, uh, with a guided interview as shown here. We've done the work of translating common phrases across all interviews. So think words like next, exit, save, required, um, get my document, um, those kind of things. We also, we support on the back end tech, the special characters that are used by some of these languages. But you as the authors need to do the actual translations of the question text, the buttons and the field labels. We don't believe in automatic translations here. So um, with legal content, we believe it's particularly important to have 
that done by professional translators or native speakers. Um, and so we don't do any machine translations on our end. The only things we have translated are those common phrases. We call it the Chrome around an interview. Um, but these 16 languages are currently supported um, and each one is sort of a, uh, has an interesting story behind it about why we support it or why it's included. Um, it may not be very common, but it's sort of our, our passport to uh, A to J author use in the past. If there is a language that you want supported that's not on here, it's fairly easy for us to add that content um, and add the ability to support it as well. There's about 35 words or so that need to be translated and then we put, it's a simple text file, we upload it and then that translation is uh, supported by A to J author. So if there's something that you want and don't see, feel free to reach out to me and we can figure out those translations and get that supported as soon as possible. This includes support for um, in A to J author, the creation of interviews, but in A to J.org, which is our, our hosting site provided by Cali, um, our parent organization, A to J.org supports uh, Vietnamese, Spanish, English, and oh, I'm blanking, there's, there's one more on the actual content around it on a to j.org as well. So the terms of service, the explanations about how to use the interviews, um, how to create or how to go through the process of getting your documents, all of that is also translated as well on a to j.org. So um, if you're interested in hosting those there, those type, those interviews and those languages there, that's available as well. Learn More is another one of our just-in-time learning features that are sort of the magic behind a, an A to J guided interview and what distinguishes us from other document assembly software tools that don't have as robust of these features. This is uh, a Learn More is a way to give the end user additional information at the point in which they need it. So you can explain a legal concept, they can, you can give them the additional resources they need to answer the question at hand, or you can give them examples of how others who are similarly situated have answered the question. These learn mores can be simple text as shown. Uh, a simple text can be a picture. So they say, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Here, for example, instead of trying to explain to an end user where they could find the content or where they need to sign when their document is completed, um, you can have a picture of the actual court form and you can have an arrow that says, you know, please sign and date here, this little yellow arrow here. That's often more help helpful too when you're asking for information about like that would be found in the caption. So the jurisdiction, uh, the court name, who the judge is, what county it's in, where it was filed, the case number, something like that. That's gonna be in a piece of paper that they're holding in their hand. You can have a picture of an example and then point with an arrow to where the content that you're asking about can be found. This is an example of a pop-up uh, in real life um, these are ones from uh, our Florida courts who are using it, explaining about uh, service by email. So it's asking, do you want to um, to be served or to have con your content delivered um, electronically, e-filing, that kind of thing. And then they have a learn more that says, why would I want to? And explains why they would want that. Here's another example of a learn more that explains what they need to do afterwards and where they can find their contents once they go through the e-filing process. So those are both um, real world examples of learn mores. A learn more can also be a video. So this is just a silly example of like, why would you choose an avatar and a video I created just showing how an avatar is picked. But you're, you can have uh, robust videos included explaining legal concepts. So there's a lot, there was a lot of video sharing um, and content creation done a couple of years ago through LSNTAP, um, and they have some great content explaining legal concepts in video format. Uh, so that would be a great example of adding a learn more um, to build that out. Some of what was already built into Ada J Author. When you're building, when you're adding this type of content, some of the things that we've added to the software that are thing that are both enhancements to the software and also things we need our authors to do, include putting tags into your content. So this is a big issue with um, with screen readers and providing the screen reader with context about multimedia content that you add. So here we have added into the question design process, this is the back end of A to J author, within your question design section, at the point in which you're uploading audio, graphics, and videos, we've added in the ability to add a media label to it. So is this media supplemental? So is it an addition to what is displayed in the text? Or is it an alternative to the text? Is it just, is it the, um, 
the text being written or a video um, explaining the same thing that the text is already explaining that gives context to the end user um, who may be using a screen reader. Same with the, with the graphic then, you can provide an alt text alternative that explains what your content is, what it should be a very short description for an ARIA reader, think less than 100 characters here. So no punctuation, just 100 character description of what it is. Um, picture of a courthouse, picture of a legal document with an arrow pointing to the content requested or whatever it is. Very short description of what the picture is that the screen reader can read to the end user who may be using it. With videos, it's important to include transcripts as well. So we have the ability for you to put in a video transcript if you include a video. YouTube does some great uh, automatic translation or transcriptions if you need that kind of content. However, you build out your uh, multimedia content, the tool you're using likely has the ability to generate transcripts fairly easily. I know I use Camtasia for some of our video editing and you can add transcripts that'll auto generate them and you can go back and quickly edit them if they're not exactly 100%. So there are quick ways to generate video transcripts as well. But all of this is important for you as authors. If you add multimedia content, you should tag that because there's only so much that we as the software developers can do. Um, you also need when you add that content to uh, be responsible for accessibility as well. Another thing authors can do to ensure your content is presented in a coherent and consistent manner is think about button positions. So A to J author allows you to have up to three buttons in an interview with a minimum of one being the continue button. Um, but when you also have the ability to change the labels on the buttons and we don't control whether you put the yes button first or the no button first, the back button first. Um, and so this is an example, um, especially in the bottom screenshot that generally the continue button is the first option. Um, and so an end user may be going through an interview and clicking continue, 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 getting used to that navigation. And then they hit a question that says, is English your first language? And the first button they're presented with is the back button rather than the yes option. And that's an author decision about what to label that button that isn't the best for accessibility. So when you're creating your content, uh, the things that you can control as an author, you should try to be as consistent as possible in um, your button selection. So always have yes first or always have no first. Always have, if you're gonna use navigation through buttons, have continue be the first option. The back button actually isn't necessary here um, because we have the back and the next button at the top in the navigation bar, which the end user using a screen reader is uh, going to be introduced to in the beginning of their interview and can choose to skip through it or uh, see it every time they, or hear it every time they come up to a screen. Um, and so you don't actually need to put that kind of navigation into your button labels um, yourself. Anyway, so that's another author tip to focus on. Now I'm gonna talk about software enhancements and things that we've done to the back end of A to J Author to make it more accessible. We did an accessibility audit in the spring of 2018 and completed many of the feature enhancements uh, in 2020. The summer of 2020, we spent uh, that time in quarantine doing a lot of accessibility work to make the interview, the viewer itself, more user-friendly. Um, and to get as high as possible within those WCAG, that Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, within their uh, AAA standard as much as possible. And we've continued to do enhancements uh, over the next two years, which I will show you. So some examples of what we've done are to ensure that when a phone number field is presented on a mobile viewer, um, the end user isn't, seen, isn't shown just the regular QWERTY keyboard and then have to switch over to the number keyboard. Instead, it recognizes that it is a phone number field or a number field and will pop up the number keyboard as well. Another enhancement is color contrast. So this is particularly important for those with color blindness. And it's also great for just anybody who's looking at it to make sure that the color contrasts are sharper between different components on the screen. We've made the entire interview ability, the ability to tab through it, which is particularly important for screen readers. And we focused hard on uh, what about tab um, functionality? So how, do, how does the user tab through an interview? What gets focused on first? Um, a lot of the metadata behind it and tagging, which I'll talk about in a second, to improve the screen reader process. That goes into the tabbing through as well. 
turns out it's a lot of these improvements are not just for people who are using assistive technology. They're really great for the average user. So I use the tab feature constantly to move, especially from entering a field, tabbing through to the continue button. You don't have to take your hand off of the keyboard to move it to the mouse. It's already um, just right there in a quick tab over. Some of the stuff was already in uh, A to J Author. So the ability to pause, stop, and expand a video. As I mentioned, we added the audio text transcripts, the uh, here's what a transcript looks like, um, all the content that you as authors can put in. Um, some of those were enhancements, some of that was already there. And then I'll talk about in a little bit project that we did this summer in 2022, adding a screen reader friendly preview for document assembly templates um, for A to J DAT text templates. That was another big enhancement for accessibility that was built into the back end of the software. Um, so here are a couple, the next couple screens are um, issues that I pulled out of our closed issue queue where we focused on metadata tags for screen readers. So we had a bunch of issues with, uh, in our issue queue that we worked through about making sure that content that was cohesive on the screen, if you were looking at it visually, was also cohesive to a screen reader because um, we don't want we wanna make sure that all of the labels and all of the content that we're presenting makes sense if viewed through a screen reader as well as visually. So for example, we implemented um, this 14.1.2, um, making sure that like the My Progress bar had uh, the, the name, the valid name for the different attributes um, included, and then that all UI components had a name and a role. That's really important for the ARIA readers. Different things like um, if icons are purely for decoration, make sure that say aria hidden equals true so that it can um, be ignored by a screen reader rather than uh, a screen reader having to constantly read over things that are purely decorative. Um, adding explanatory text for controls. So like next button explaining that it is next step um, or next question, things like that. We added the back end labels to explain what if they're just hearing next, what is that next to? And then um, here, anytime content is required, uh, making sure that it was clear that this kind of content was ARIA required, that kind of stuff. So it's a lot of these ARIA tags and headers, um, making sure things are tagged properly as H1, H2, H3 for headers, all stuff that you can't really see behind if you're an, uh, an author just creating this interview. Um, but we made sure that this was tested with screen readers, that um, we used people who were native screen readers to do a lot of the testing or that use screen readers frequently and really making sure that the, the back end stuff that we can control was as accessible as possible. If at any time you hear from your end users that something is not working as expected, we are always open to doing uh, fixes to make things as accessible as possible. So please feel free to reach out to us. My email will be at the end, but um, accessibility is very important for the A to J author team. One, so the, um, the thing we added this summer during uh, 2022 was an, uh, we worked with Atlanta Legal Services um, on a TIG, a Technology Innovation Grant, to add a preview button for document assembly. So this is sort of narrow in that it only works with A to J templates and it only works with A to J text templates. So if you are using A to J author as a front end for your case management system or a hot docs template or an e-filing system or even the A to J PDF templates, um, this is not um, applicable, um, but we had an interesting way in which we automate we actually do the document assembly part for text templates and made it fairly easy to create um, this preview option for screen readers. So sometimes it's difficult for end users with screen readers to uh, quote unquote see their final document once it's produced into a PDF because PDFs are particularly gnarly for screen readers, which I'll talk about that in a second. But this gave us a point in which we could stop the document assembly process and give them a preview of what their document is going to look like to ensure that all of the content is there as expected um, before it becomes the PDF and is more closed off to screen readers. So when text templates are available in an interview, when you as an author have created a text template, and the end user runs through it, whatever they have answered meets the ability to generate that text template. So it meets whatever conditions you may have set um, for the text template. They will get a button at the very end on that last question, the where your submit or get my document button is, that will say you have documents that can be previewed. And they are given the ability to open a document preview, 
and then they are showed an HTML version of their document. So this is an example of what would render for the end user. It's an HTML representation of what their final PDF will look like. It contains, for example, all the variables that they have answered. This one only has the one. You said your first name, oops, sorry. You said your first name was Jane here in the second line, and that Jane is a variable. So it is doing the, the work of document assembly and that it is replacing variables with the values the end user has given. And it is showing the end user, including those using a screen reader, what the final document will look like. So they have a chance to check before they actually create the PDF um, that they are going to then submit to the court. Here's another example. This is just a simple one that has a text template. And then there's also a PDF template in this uh, document assembly package. And it says a preview for a first name only PDF template test could not be generated because it is a PDF. So um, even if you have a mix of text templates and PDF templates, only text templates are going to render, but at least it gives a warning to the end user that there's more content that will generate in their final package that is not displayed um, here. This again is only for text templates created using A to J's document assembly tool, the DAT, um, but it is one step further giving those with screen readers the ability to uh, quote unquote see what is going to be in their final package. So we knew that a lot of templates are going to be created using um, PDFs as starting points. You aren't going to be using the text template, which is, um, if you're unfamiliar with A to J's document assembly tool, text templates are more like a blank Google Doc where you add elements to it to build out a final document. There's also PDF templates where you start with an existing PDF form and automate on top of that. A lot of times you're going to have the existing court form already in PDF format, and that's what you're going to want to automate. So it is more common to use PDFs as a starting point. And then we created also under that TIG with Atlanta, a best practices guide for me making PDFs more accessible. So it's on our website. It's linked here. But this best practice guide was our attempt to go through a, with Adobe Pro. It does require Adobe Pro. And uh, the, it gives you four sections about making, about adding accessibility tools to your Adobe Pro version, making the PDF accessible, common accessibility issues, and learn more. And it has screenshots of the different features in Adobe to make your, your PDF as best as possible. So PDFs are notoriously terrible with screen readers. This helps provide a lot of um, making it as best as possible. So for a lot of the work we do, that is what we're shooting for as best as possible with the tools that we have at the time. And this is one of the options. Um, it's not only applicable to PDFs that are gonna be automated using A to J. You should definitely do this if you're using it with Hot Docs um, or any other uh, PDF automating tools. Um, but you can also use this for PDFs that you have on your website that are not going to be automated. Once you get Adobe Pro and you enable a lot of these um, the icons and add-ins for accessibility, it does a great job of running through the accessibility checker automatically and, and fixing a lot of the issues um, that are most common. So uh, once I did this and did the work of figuring it out and adding it in and creating this best practices guide, now it automatically asks me every time I open up Adobe, um, if I want to run accessibility, what order I want to run it in, um, if I want to do a check. And so all the content that we generate in normal PDF format, um, not with document assembly, can be run through this accessibility as well. So this is available um, on our website, uh, Best Practices Guide for Creating Accessible uh, PDF Templates. It's under our authoring guide. So if you go to our authoring guide, the Best Practices Guide is right here at the very bottom under Appendix C. So um, you can check that out. OK, well, I'm not seeing any questions uh, in the chat or the question box and no hands raised. So um, if you all do have questions, you can always feel free to reach out to me throughout the month between our webinars, jessica at cali.org. Um, and if I don't have the answer, I will try and research it for you or point you to uh, another appropriate resource. So feel free to reach out. And thank you all for attending. We'll see you next month in November.